Hey friends, welcome back to the Ball Booktuber. My name is Scott. Today I'm very excited to have a major published author and one of my favorite authors on the planet with us today. We have the God Emperor of the Solon Empire. We have the architect of one of my favorite series I've ever read, and that is the wonderful Sun Eater series. Uh, this is Christopher Rocchio, and he's going to share his top 10 favorite fantasy series with us today. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, man. This will be fun. I was saying before we started recording, you gave me an existential crisis uh, <laughs> asking me to fill out this list. Um, I thought of myself as like a fantasy reader first and a science fiction reader second, but given the relative difficulty in putting together these two lists, I don't think that's actually true. Uh, my first love of definitely was fantasy. My favorite book of all time, which we'll get to, is of course. obvious which one it is, is, is fantasy. But yeah. most of what I've read and most of the like sort of like if I use the word academic appreciation for, you know, the art form that I have is science fiction. I had a, mm -hmm. a, a science fiction class when I was in high school. It was taught by like an old school fan. So I grew up reading, uh, especially in that period, I read a lot of like, you know, a a Asimov, Clark, Heinlein, and then earlier mm -hmm. too, like Brackett and Burroughs and, and like Seal Moore and a bunch of those writers. So I'm really well, I guess, catechized in, uh, in science fiction. But Fantasy, and, and this is where, like, I'm going to warn everyone in advance, this list is weird because I have read, like, none of the giant series, with almost none of the giant series. I've never read Wheel of Time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've never really, like, been interested in it. It's just, like, so long that, like, as a kid, That's I was like, I could read, like, four other series, man. Uh, and it wasn't done at the time, like, when I was, like, really into, like, uh, the other uh, the other epic fantasy I was reading. So I never made that leap. I tried to read Malazan or Malazan, however you're supposed to say it. I think Malazan is better. Malazan uh, is correct, I think. I say yeah. Malazan, but, yeah, you're good. Yeah, I had no idea. But uh, I got about halfway through Guardians of the Moon and decided that wasn't the right fit for me, right? Uh, same problem, like, you know, really, you know, like, way longer even than my books, right? And my <laughs> books are not short. So I, before anyone accuses me of hypocrisy, they're longer than mine. Um, and uh, so I haven't read that. I haven't read Robin Hobb. I haven't read um, Scott Lynch. Uh, or, you know, like a lot of those big names, right? And I like, I'm not, I know a lot of them are, you know, great, right? I just never happened. Um, so this is going to be a weird list for that reason, uh, you know, mostly, right? Uh, but also because uh, I have realized, oh, oh, and the other one I've never read is really Brandon Sanderson. I read Elantris <laughs> once about 15 years ago. Um, and no, you know, not my that favorite. was it. Right. Yeah. That's what everyone tells me. That's, that's his worst book. Right. So I you know, made, a, made a bad move, but I I've never been back around. And the other like reason I think this is the case is that I find that I like a lot of, uh, a, a lot of it less. Right. So there were some things that I used to really like that I like went and thought about and, and couldn't put on the list anymore. And I won't name those names because I don't want to like, For sure. I'm, not, I'm not trying to be negative, but there is yeah. like, there's like a lot of tropes in fantasy that like the more and more I learn about history, just like aren't right right? Like they don't like mesh with actual, you know, medieval history and things. And so seeing them, right. And, and we're seeing people believe that that's what like real life is like, turns yeah. me off of a lot of fantasy. I thought, like, like witch burnings, right? Like witch burnings did not happen that commonly in the middle ages, right? They're like an early modern thing, but they're in like every fantasy series, right? Where the magic is actually real, right? So if someone can actually summon demons, like maybe burning them is not as bad. Like this book doesn't make sense to me, right? So like I have a, I have a really love hate relationship, I think, with with the genre, but uh, you know, emphasis love, right? Love. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I it was hard. The point is, it was hard, right? I was telling you, like, I had like a literal like like nightmare where I was trying to, like, I woke up and I was like, uh, oh shit, like I need to finish that list because I, I was had this horrible dream where I like had four of the four of the ten on the list, and everyone was making fun of me and assumed I was a faker. So, uh, like, it really, like, did a number on me trying to get this uh, together, right? So, uh, you know, preamble done, right? <laughs> um, the only other, like, caveats here are uh, that, like, as with the list I did for Moid on my favorite science fiction books, yeah. uh, I'm not going to repeat authors. So, like, okay. there are a couple authors, like, if I really wanted to be pedantic, could, like, blow the list out. I think between, like, the top three, like, I could just finish the list if I just wanted to pick individual yeah. books. So, I'm not going to repeat anybody. Um, and a lot of these are series, right? I think there's one standalone novel. Yeah, there's one standalone novel. Okay, cool. Um, you know, so like some of the authors are still getting multiple books, but I'm not gonna, you know, yep. um, I'm not gonna ruin it. Uh, and the only other thing is that I really had to do a two-way tie for number 10. So number 10. Oh, all good. Uh, number 10 
Uh, and sorry to like word vomit at you, man. No, Please. you're real right. quick before we get into it. I just wanted to say hello to Theo and Madison. I love you both. Thanks for being on the stream. I didn't know anyone was going to join. So oh, awesome. good yeah. to see you both. Uh, um, but sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Number 10. Yeah, no, my bad. Uh, but so number 10 for me uh, is going to be an even split between the Old Kingdom trilogy by Garth Nix. Uh, okay. And uh, the uh, Lost Years of Merlin by T.A. Barron. Now, these are both YA series. Okay. But they were really important to me because, uh, like, everyone has, like, that book that takes you out from being, like, just the, the reader of the one thing your parents gave you to a reader generally. Right. And these both were that for me. I was a Harry Potter kid, right? I was exactly <laughs> the right age for those books. I actually read them before, like, all of the other kids my age were reading them because I read really early. I got the yeah. first one when it came out. I was like four or five. I think it you, came out. You're nine. younger than us. We we were we we're aware. Yes. Yeah, I'm trying to <laughs> bully everybody, right? But I, I read them really early, and I was literally bullied by like the my classmates for reading them. And those are the kids who went on to like go to Universal Studios and get custom wands. And I'm over here like I don't care about those books anymore, right? Like I moved on. But for me, right? Um, uh, we used to have this book fair at, uh, I went to Catholic school, we had a book fair where you could go and buy books like twice a year, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Garth Nix's Sabriel was was there one year. And it, you know, it had kind of a similar look to it. I don't know if you've ever read him, have you? Um, I am aware of who Garth Nix is. I've read gotcha. none of his words. And who so, was he? T.A. Uh, T.A. Barron, uh, Lost Baron. Years of Merlin. Yeah. Yeah, I'll uh, have to look into it. Yeah, they're both they're both excellent. Uh, but uh, Sabriel, right? The Garth, the first book in the Garth Nix trilogy is about this young lady who has sort of like the job of being an anti necromancer, right? She inherits this position from her father, kind of unwillingly because he goes missing, and uh, it's set in this cool sort of like circa World War One period fantasy world uh, where there's a wall that divides the North and the South, much like another famous series. Mm -hmm. Although I think this one is slightly older. I might be wrong about that. Okay. Uh, and, uh, the magic's died out in the South and she's in school down there when her dad goes missing and she has to go North and figure out what happened to him and also gets wrapped up in these like succession crisis in the North kingdom, which is more magical, but it deals really heavily with like, you know, the undead and, uh, and necromancy. And it's just, mm -hmm. it's a lot spookier. And because of that, it felt a lot more grown up to me at the time, but it's absolutely a YA series. And I was always a spooky kid, right? I still am. I wear, I wear black every single day at this point. If I don't, people freak out. Like my, my wife's like, Oh, stop it. That's a red shirt. Mm. No. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, at this point I've memed myself into, into, into this, uh, into this sort of stereotype, but, um, but I really, really liked, I really, really liked those books and the rest of the trilogy gets even bigger, right. And deals with like, you know, some old God that's been sealed away. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's got a lot of the usual, like, you know, yep. wild magic and it's a great, great series. He went on and did a couple more later, um, that I haven't read, so I can't speak to okay. those. The original trilogy is Sabriel and then Lyra L and Abhorson. Um, and the Abhorsons are these anti necromancers, right? And so, cool. um, great series. And you're an audiobook guy, the audiobooks for these are read by Tim Curry, like the Tim Curry. No kidding, yeah, he's they are book. awesome. They're okay. so good. If you're looking for a quick listen, you don't want anything too heavy, trilogy is absolutely worth it, and especially if you've got like. You know, you got kids, you got younger readers, anyone in the audience. These are great. They're not like middle grade by any means. They're like solid, like YA, you know, um, great, great series. And so too with uh, with the Merlin books, T.A. Barron. I can't remember all. I think there are five. I think there are five. The first one's Lost Years of Merlin. And I was all, I was really steeped in Arthurian stuff as like a kid because my parents liked Excalibur, right? There was the Disney Sword and Stone movie. I read T.H. White. Um, and, uh, you know, really like... You know, I'd forgotten about T.H. White until I just said that. Like, maybe he should be on the list. But um, but he won't be because I've already written the list. I'm committing to it. Uh, but but read T.H. White. Uh, but because of the movie, and especially because of all things, this, like, um, there's a mini series where Sam Neill was Merlin. I was, like, a big Merlin fan. Uh, I watched that thing until the DVD burned out. Um, and this series was about, like, a young Merlin. And my brain, like, doesn't know there are different takes on it. So I just assume there's, like, one big, you know, Arthur lore that, like, a bunch of people have written in. Which is broadly the case, right? But they mm -hmm. contradict each other. And so, like, this Merlin, like, goes blind, you know, as a kid. But, like, learns to see with magic. And, you know, uh, leaves, uh, he leaves Wales, um, you know, and uh, and goes to this sort of magical land. And has to fight, you know, uh, um you know, uh, Celtic gods and, and sorcerers and all this stuff. It's very disconnected 
from the sort of main Arthurian canon, but that really sort of took me out of the like Harry Potter and like struggling to read Lord of the Rings space that I was in and mm -hmm. made me generally a reader, like between those and Star Wars books, right? Like yeah. that's what really made me a reader. And so those two get a special place uh, here on the list. And that's the thing when we go through this list, like the, the top half, I'm going to make some really strong objective quality claims about the bottom half is like books that are important to me. Uh, hey, there's at least no wrong answers here. That's all right. Here. So uh, number nine, uh, and this is maybe if I had to put TH White back on the list, I'd put him here. Uh, but uh, is is the Witcher books, uh, Andrei Sapkowski. Uh, I know they tend to be kind of polarizing for folks because of the the pros. I blame that on the translator. My one of my best friends is Polish. And he tells me in Polish, like he's in, in Poland, particularly, he's known for his prose, right? Heard, so like, yeah. That is something we've lost in translation. Yeah. And I, I kind of control for that in thinking about it. I usually don't like deconstructions, right? Because he kind of will take apart all of the old fairy tales and kind of make them these sort of grim, dark, you know, situations. Mm -hmm. That is fun sometimes, right? And so I'm kind of cutting across type by liking these books as much as I do. Uh, but I really like them. I, I like the way the books end, you know, with the sort of, you know, kind of multi-dimensional stuff that's going on. That mm -hmm. reminds me in a lot of ways of uh, the sort of Arthur stuff I was reading as a kid. And so while it's, you know, got this really kind of edgy adult sort of, I guess, edge to them, right? Uh, it kind of harks back to the fantasy I was reading as a kid in this really meaningful way. And of yep. course, you know, I'm a big video game guy. So the video games were actually my way into, for, as is the case for so many Witcher fans, mm -hmm. into, that, uh, into that series. Um, yeah, I was going to ask about that because I know that that's the case for a lot of Witcher fans. Yeah, yeah. Did you watch the show at all too? Or I have, yeah. I, I'm not as hard on it as some people are. It's not as good. It is not the same. And I think the fact that it's not the same uh, is why I'm less hard on it because it's doing it kind of its own story at this point and sure. it's trying to you know blend stuff. This is something that like I, I saw them talking about in relation to House of the Dragon, right? Uh -huh. They um, which I watched the first episode of. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, I was I that's was big praise awesome. from you, so I'll take it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I had one <laughs> quibble. We could talk about some other time, okay, uh, so but good. like I thought it was great. I'm a huge Matt Smith fan, so just. Yes. Him at all, you know, is is something I'm showing up for, and and as Damon Targaryen, uh, yeah, I'm in. So, um, but we we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but like they're talking about, um, they're talking about how uh, like the show isn't going to follow the book because the book is, you know, is fake history, right? So we're gonna show you the real events. And yep. there's been sort of this vein in adapting a lot of fantasy lately, where they're like, we're not gonna make it the same. And sometimes that's because they like hate the source material. And when that's true, like that's not fun. But when they're trying to use it to elevate the source material or kind of like give fans something else, that can be okay. And yeah. I think The Witcher show isn't isn't perfect, um, you know, in a lot of ways. I have a lot of pretty serious quibbles with it, none of them being, you know, Geralt's perfect, right? Uh, sure. And that's like, if, if that were off, then the show would be irredeemable, but Henry Cavill's great in that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't mind the digressions so much, uh, even though they're a different thing. Because the games kind of do the same thing. The games themselves are a retcon of the book's ending, right? Uh, because they wanted to tell more stories. And the way that yep. the books end, it's kind of a kind of a closed bargain, right? I don't, I don't want to spoil it for anybody. But it's not possible for the games to happen unless they do some retconning. And that <laughs> is polarizing for a lot of people, although weirdly like in reverse, right? Where they go back and read the original books and they're like, oh, the games are better. Uh, and, um, cause they, you know, they give us kind of a more fairy tale ending to things, which, um, is uh, sort of an interesting place for the books to be in. But, uh, because of that, I think I'm more forgiving of the show doing its own thing. Um, sure. and I can kind of look at in the same way that like, there are these different, you know, Arthurian canons that have different, you know, right. uh, like is Lancelot even there, right? Uh, you know, is, is he the one who finds the grail? Is it Galahad? We don't know. In the same way that there are lots of different Arthurs, having like three different witchers kind of works for me. Yeah. Um, and for it too, because um, I have, you know, this, this close friend who's like really Polish, right? Like he literally lies to people and says he was born in Poland. He was born here, really? but, like, but Polish is his first language, right? You know, and okay. he really identifies with the culture. And I, yeah. and I grew up hearing about all, all of this stuff, you know, because we're, you know, we're real close. So being yeah. able to, like, understand some of the, like, folklore he's talking about and having that inroad, right, has been really fun for me just because it means so much to my friend and to our friendship to have this thing. So this is another 
series that like the sort of the whole sort of extended canon around has become important to me because of this friendship. Um, so yeah, so I, I really like those books. I understand why people find them polarizing, but I especially like the short story collections at the beginning. That's what I've heard. Uh, even like mega fans tend to tell me that those are their favorite parts of it. So I, I haven't read any of it. I've watched a little bit of the show, but uh, uh, so cool. Cool. Yeah. Well, I will, I will, uh, I will move on from that one. I think uh, having, having sung its praises. And, oh, audio though. Cause you want to yeah. know about audio. Peter Kenny does the audio. I he's great, the, right? Right. Yeah. I, I think he's awesome. He yeah. almost actually, uh, he was on the short list for yeah. uh, Sun Eater early on. Um, they, uh, they went with, they went with, uh, John Lee for the first one over in the UK. This is mm -hmm. the UK audios. Cause I have two yeah. separate sets and, uh, you know, he, I've talked to him a few times. He's a really cool guy. Um, but, um, number eight then, and this is when I said there's one on the, on the list that can't be audioed. This is not one. And that's because, and, uh, it's because it's not a book. It's, uh, okay. it's, it's a graphic novel series and uh -huh. it's, it's, it's Berserk. By I thought it would be higher for you, so I'm surprised it's only number eight. Yeah, uh, I had to think about it, uh, and I really, really like it, but um, I felt guilty putting something that wasn't uh, a novel series on the list at all. So uh, that, that kind of like was a trick, and I'm, I feel less qualified, too, to talk about things like craft and style when it's it's not a novel um, but in terms of, you know, the, the, the character work, right, um, and the, like, sort of high drama of it all, Berserk is really, really just top-notch, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've seen that it's sort of a lot of people's first manga series because of, like, Booktube and stuff, and that's sure. maybe unfair to people because it's almost all downhill from there <laughs> in, in certain ways. It's, it's so good. Uh, it's so careful uh in its uh in its character building and the relationships and in handling to the really really heavy themes right because it deals uh not just with war right um and not just with like the supernatural and hell and all of these things and and, um, yeah. and stuff but it deals with um you know uh it deals with like sexual assault and and like really serious violence and ptsd and a lot of stuff and to do that in a graphic novel right where you don't have internal you know a lot of internal monologuing is really impressive um and people tend to think that it's you know by nature of its very graphic nature that it's it's not really sensitive or deep in dealing with these things but it uh manages to be really sympathetic to even its worst characters at times and these are characters that are like really awful, right? Really awful. And to manage that sensitivity in a graphic novel, right, uh, is really an accomplishment. And to and to keep people uh, not just invested but so dedicated, right? Because it's sort of like the the manga, like Song of Ice and Fire, in the sense of like there were so many like delays and you know um, extensions and hiatuses, and there would be years where there's nothing. Which for a comic book is really weird because it's supposed to come out like every few weeks. Right. Um, and, and the, the fervor only got stronger. Right. Um, and then of course he tragically passed away, but mm -hmm. even when, uh, when he passed away, right. He managed the, the last chapter still managed to close, uh, in, on an emotional note that like would have worked if they hadn't decided to continue it. And they have, and yeah. so far the quality is sort of held up, um, which is, yeah, been, you've, you've read the new stuff, right? Yeah. It's been really surprising and encouraging. And I would, Strongly recommend it to anybody who can handle, you know, the the level of, of darkness in it. Because I I've been a frequent critic of sort of the grim dark uh, subgenre, right? Uh, because the it's because of the nihilism, right? And this sure. never really goes there. It really focuses on the the struggle of uh, who uh, what is ultimately an ordinary guy, right? Now he's super ordinary in like that he refuses to give up, uh, you know, refuses to surrender, and is capable of some pretty titanic feats of strength but he doesn't have any native superpowers he's more akin to batman than superman right he just right. has fought so hard and through so much against literally like satan himself right uh and uh and hasn't and hasn't quit and so it's not really grim dark even though it's darker than almost anything else i've read right and and that that's, that's sort of like extreme uh that sort of emotional extreme space is something I'm really interested in as an artist and as a reader generally. And it really, really uh, pulls that off. Is um, there anything of guts and gang in your books or is it? Uh, something oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, that That's it, sort of that general, uh, that sort of, 
band of brothers dynamic is something mm -hmm. really getting the feel for crystallized um for me reading berserk in, in a lot of ways although i read berserk i think after i think after howling dark uh i read it fairly recently this has been a fairly recent uh my the same friend uh the polish friend insisted for years that i read it and i always put it off because i'm really bad about taking recommendations i uh, just like yeah one of these days i owned um book of the new sun for like 15 years before i read it yeah. um you know i'm just because i'm a bad friend basically uh <laughs> and um and so i finally read it and he had the we were he was my roommate at the time uh, so i couldn't escape and he just was like here it is i'm gonna leave it on the table for you yeah uh, and i like blew through the whole thing in a couple months um yeah. you know so he was like see i told you you should listen to me more and i was like half ah, fine you know um but it's uh it's great uh and so yeah it was it's certainly been an influence and there are a couple sort of more symbolic uh references to the series uh as well uh in yeah. my own work um because of course it's what i do right i i yeah. want people to see the dna uh, and to recognize that what I my, that my work is part of a tradition, right? Um, because it all is, right? Like none of us, you know, uh, writing fantasy, science fiction, any of it, uh, writing period is writing outside of a culture, outside of a tradition. It's not possible. Uh, and so, no, no, there's definitely, definitely some DNA in there. Of course, within the context of like anime and manga, it is one of the most influential works of of art of all time, right? It influences uh, like in video game video, video games too with like dark souls and um uh elden ring and bloodborne um the guy who makes those is a huge fan but you can see its influence in things like full metal alchemist uh mm -hmm. and other in other works of, uh, of of japanese art as well uh, anime manga video games whatever that may be uh hugely influential uh piece of fantasy um before we uh, move on to number seven yeah, uh, I, I can ramble forever no, you're good. I, I think I would be a Durfee and I can't read things backwards, so I would have a hard time with any kind of manga. Uh, secondly, I see everybody's comments in the in the messages and I appreciate it. I just can't keep up with them. But Mike is being hilarious. So thanks for joining Mike and thanks for joining Caitlin and everybody. Oh, else. hey, Mike. Yeah, I, yeah I'm, a, I'm your bad friend too. I haven't read Red Rising. Although in Red Rising's case, I'm doing that on purpose, right? Because <laughs> Of course. Enough people are like, oh my gosh, you clearly stole from it. I'm like, I don't know what it is uh you know so it's gonna, to me the two head. series are not a ton similar other than the ancient greco-roman stuff like that's yeah, yeah of that's course, the biggest thing between them. pierce brown made up rome so uh um, that's right they're, they're cop. uh it's all it's all imaginary um <laughs> sorry please continue with number seven i can't wait for the number next seven one. i believe is is late is your favorite right is the song uh, of ice and fire it is indeed um, yes yeah and it is it is great i you know i i make fun of george occasionally because uh, we have very different sort of uh ethical sort of stances on things for but sure. the more i thought about it because I, I talked about earlier how there were like things i used to really like that i couldn't uh i couldn't in good conscience include on the list anymore <laughs> I really struggled to keep this one here, but it's so damn good. Uh, Indeed it is. Like, uh, regardless of my sort of differences with George, especially like his opinions on Tolkien, which is like, who boy. Uh, it's, he it's, loves Tolkien just in a different way than some people do. Yeah, yeah. It's just one of those one of those friendships, I guess. That yeah, um, you just don't get from the outside. Yeah. Um, but like the world building, man, the character work, uh, and the man knows how to start and end chapters like mm -hmm. no one else, right? Those books are so long, and they're not even they're not necessarily fast paced. But like every time you end a chapter, like I have to read another one. Mm -hmm. Unless Cersei, sometimes that can be demoralizing. You turn the page, you're like ah oh, again. Ugh. <laughs> uh, book four is book four is a bit of a trial, but like. Um, <laughs> I love uh, Feast for Crows, but I, I get when people don't. So I, I love I love a lot of it. Uh, weirdly, uh, because I, I also I, I did these audio, right? And I know that the Roy <laughs> Dotrice recordings are polarizing for a lot of people, but for some reason I got the John Lee version of a Feast for Crows. I don't oh, yeah. know. Um I don't know how that happened if Roy because I know there's a Roy Dotrice recording now. He came back and re-recorded it. Uh, okay, that's what happened. Yeah. But that John Lee recording was because John Lee is one of my favorite narrators. He's yep. just like so resonant, right? He's got this really sort of like uh, sepulchral, like stagecraft. Like he he feels like a Shakespeare villain, right? Mm -hmm. um, something about that performance was so good that even though Feast for Crows is my least favorite of the five, mm -hmm. um, that it, it still like holds up. Especially like the Dorn stuff. I really I really like Dorn Martell, which yeah. is one of the reasons the show pisses me off so much. Indeed. um 
Yeah. Because I'm also a huge Alexander Siddig fan. Uh, I wanted him to be Oberon originally. Yeah. And when they him for Doran, I was like, close enough. And then they <laughs> just they just just spiked it right in the ground. Not good. Yeah, correct. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tragic, tragic stuff. Um, and um, so anyway, that that um, but those chapters in Feast for Crows really uh, really resonate for me. I think a lot about the the scene where he's explaining, like, like it's slowly unfolding how meticulous, how well planned he's being, right? And like the orange trees, the blood oranges, mm -hmm. right, are, are hitting the uh, the marble marble pavers, right? So there are blood splatters all around as he's sort of, you know, uh, contemplating very peacefully, right, his revenge, right? It's 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 really great imagistically right and and we don't talk a lot about like the sort of symbolic edge in in george's writing is everybody yep. just about how much he loves killing people he's a, a tremendous writer um you know uh he's uh you know, again like he's a writer that i have a lot of strong disagreements with uh but i um uh, i really i i think the books are excellent i own all five of them signed uh i met george in 2014 at a convention oh, nice. Um, and that was really cool for me, uh, you know, um, and I, you know, I remember when the show ended, I was, and they started talking about doing more shows. I'm like, I don't care. I'm not going to look anymore. The ending was so bad. Right. Uh, but I am also the same person who will watch new Star Wars stuff when it comes out, despite that whole franchise ending with some girl we've never heard of apparently being the chosen one somehow, uh, apparently. for some reason. And it all ends badly, but I'll go. I'll go watch Rogue One again. Sure, fine, right? Uh, so I went and, and I watched the new show, and I think it's pretty good. You know, it's weird that I'm more excited about that than the Lord of the Rings show, but that's the world we live in. Um, I'm gonna try the Lord of the Rings show. I don't think I'm going to be happy about it, but I don't have a lot to add. Everybody knows how much I love it. I will make fun of Mike slightly. He said Dorn is the best house. Dorn is a place. Martell is the house. Yeah, so, Mike. Uh, come on. Nerd. Come on, <laughs> uh, yeah, I know uh, the Martells are my favorite house too, though. Uh, so yeah, they're great. Uh, that they're might great. be the like you know Mediterranean Italian sort of thing you know mm -hmm. represent, but uh, yeah, but no, they're awesome, right? Um, no, and they're just there's so many uh, there's so many characters right that are that are that are just, they're so well realized, even if they're awful, right? Every one of them feels credible. Mm -hmm. right um i would have liked it if there were maybe more decent human beings in the mix um sure. you know I, I don't believe everybody is quite that bad but not um, enough heads for you yeah exactly uh you know a couple more would be nice uh you know and a couple more like actually managing to make some headway would be good too i'm just not as much of a pessimist as he is fundamentally but every single character is great right like you yeah. understand why they are the way they are they're all very distinct they're all very well realized um and it's a you know fun is a weird way to describe the world but it is a fun world right yep. one, of the, one of the things too that like people don't talk about is like how much like like conan lovecraft like old school fantasies floating around in the background there's some really eldritch stuff in the deep lore i kind of wish it was more present but the fact that it's not contributes to that kind of lovecraft feel in the first place mm -hmm. um you know yeah, like it definitely I, worse as influences as well so yeah, and it's uh, and I have a lot of those same sort of influences, right? Mm -hmm. I have a, a similar love hate relationship with like Neil Gaiman. Like Neil Gaiman loves everything that I love, and yet like has like a completely opposite perspective on everything. Um, yep. But as a yep. consequence, like you know, I feel like he's a writer that like you know we have something to talk about, right? At least talk about in like a creative like back and forth, right? Like I'll respond to your beliefs and vice versa, right? Uh, which is which is really cool um but yeah so um we bounce off my favorite series ever alistair marlowe and uh tywin lannister any link there any influence there not consciously uh i I've, I've seen people point to like a couple like sort of thoughts that alistair's had that are like very tywin mm -hmm. uh, and, and like i can't say that that wasn't you know that there isn't a connection there but i wasn't <laughs> thinking about tywin at all when uh well, i was thinking I about yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's a good question, though, because, like, especially, I think it's Chapter 9 of Empire of Silence, where they have their back and forth, be like, this is a Taiwan conversation, like, yeah, maybe, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but that was not on purpose. Um, no worries. That yeah, yeah. Cool. No, no, I'm happy uh, to answer well, the question. So. We could stay on Song of Ice and Fire all day, but we don't have that kind of time, so let's move on to number six. 
already. Uh, speaking of uh, Lovecraft, uh, is 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 Lovecraft, and I know people think that he you think of him maybe uh, science fiction first or horror first, and then science fiction and then fantasy. But this mm -hmm. is not how people thought of H.P. Lovecraft for like most of his existence. Uh, yeah. He used to be the mascot of the World Fantasy Convention, right? Fantasy used to be, you know, kind of in this sort of Lovecraft uh, plus sword and sorcery space. And it's only really turned into epic fantasy really mm -hmm. in the last like 30 years. Um, and I think of him sort of in this old mold because the Lovecraft stuff I really like is like the dream cycle. Uh, and is uh, my f my favorite is the case of Charles Dexter Ward, which is about the Salem witch trials, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's his only real novel. And it's, you know, Lovecraft's complicated for a lot of reasons, right? But like he always like explains too much, right? And you can kind of see the twists coming in Charles Dexter Ward, but mm -hmm. it doesn't. It, it, there's almost like the inevitability of that makes it stronger in a certain way. Uh, and it too, like you can see the linkages in that to a bunch of his other ideas, and it's re so it's really hard to pick out a single thread in Lovecraft because they're all <laughs> part of like the same big work, yeah. right? Uh, and it's so it's people tend to think of like the Cthulhu mythos plus like this extra crap we don't know what to do with, but like it's all together, right? The Dream Cycle is about Nyarlathotep to an extent too, right? And all of this stuff, um, you know, really comes back together. And um, and he he ties in you know his sort of science fictional ideas with his occult influences, and despite the fact that the man was like a dyed in the wool orthodox like atheist, right? Mm -hmm. um, he like continues to insist that like there's a linkage between the occult, the demonic magic, and like aliens and science. And this idea is something that's really influential in in my own work uh, mm -hmm. and in my own like tastes too, yep. right? Uh, cause like, I'm always talking about how like the aliens are demons, right. Um, you know, and, and so this is something that's really left an impact on me, obviously has been, is possibly, you know, the most influential, you know, speculative fiction writer, whatever you want to call them. I know some people are going to be like, why is he on your fancy list? I get that. Um, I but assumed he would be on there cause we've kind of talked a little bit about how you see his work and stuff. So I, I would have been surprised if he wasn't on there. So yeah. Yeah. But um, sadly my nerd card is not full and I haven't read any Lovecraft. So I need oh, to really? Oh, dude, dude, you're in for, you're in for some, uh, some good times. No, he's great. Um, and it, it's this like tremendous, like, like out of the blue imagination too, right? Like he, he didn't really create cosmic horror. He kind of codifies it. This is usually the way with like people who create things like Tolkien's not the first person to write something that's recognizably epic fantasy. He just right. typifies it in a way that becomes identified with him. But he pulls all of these, uh, his whole mythology, like out of his, you know, out of his head, right? Out of his dreams, really. He was like, um, cause this is sort of one of the ways in which he's such a contradictory figure is that he was such a, like a materialist reductionist, you know, science guy, right? But he had these really vivid nightmares, right? That were kind of these mystical experiences for him. And that's where he gets a lot of these ideas. And it's like trying to like rationalize those two parts of himself that makes him, mm -hmm. that makes him such a compelling writer, right? Um, and he is, you know, even the like parts, you know, the, the uglier parts of his character, right? He's so contradictory on, right? Yeah. Uh, and, it, and he, and he, he changes and grows throughout his really, really difficult life. Uh, and it's a lot of that's on the page. You can see, you know, like his his personal defects, but you can see too his struggles with, you know, like like the abuse he received as a child, and like um, some of like his mental issues. Like it's really, really, really visible, which is which lends to the sort of strength of his writing, the strength of his character, and uh, gives us these crazy ideas, right? Which like nobody really has been able to like take that the cosmic horror stuff uh farther than he has really mm -hmm. right they've been able to do different things with it sure. um you know but like in terms of really pushing those boundaries into like the weird he's still the master uh and uh, and that's why like even the people who come after him who like need to knock him down to feel a little bit taller yeah. uh can't do better right like he's just really a tremendous talent and he also too um really helped create like the community around science fiction and fantasy in the first place. He's like the most prolific letter writer in the English language. Mm -hmm. And by like drawing all these writers together, he kind of creates the network that lays the foundation for fandom itself, which is something that like no one ever credits him with, but like it's hugely, hugely important. Um, and he only 
really survives to this day because those other people felt the need to preserve his work after it was gone out of out of love for the man himself which yep. um is is uh really important really so as a historical figure he is indispensable um and speaking of those friends though uh, <laughs> number five yeah. uh and and this is probably also obvious because you know you and i've been talking for a long time this is is conan uh yep. is, is robert e howard howard is a writer that I like really personally identify with. Um, I think I have one more year before I was, I think he killed himself when he was 30. Um, yeah. 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 Um, but he was, you know, deeply introverted, uh, you know, uh, and sort of naturally inclined to be a history geek, but he like felt this huge pressure to like sort of step up and be like the characters he was writing about. Um, and that's something that really like, the, the more I've read about, about Howard as I've uh, gone over, is a writer that I feel a very close personal uh, sort of a, a connection to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and he's writing, you know, um, you know these these great adventure stories, uh, and he has this reputation for being, you know, like kind of just a brute and a simpleton. It is it's not the case, and that's neither true of Conan, right? My favorite Conan story is Tower of the Elephant. Right. Uh, so if I have to pick one Robert uh, Robert Howard work, it's going to be that. Uh, but as with Lovecraft, it's really hard to like cut anything out, right? Uh, you know, there's only really the one Conan novel, right? Hour of the Dragon. I think it's the only one. In the same way, there's only really one Lovecraft novel, right. but um, uh, but they all really create this sort of portrait of this character. And I like it's all the same world too, right? Like all of his characters are supposed to be in the same timeline. So Call predates Conan, but like you know, there are uh, references to uh, you know, the Hyborian and the Atlantean ages in Bran McMorn, in Solomon Kane. Uh, and so he's really working on creating the sort of extended uh, mythology in the same way Lovecraft is that kind of sets the blueprint for a lot of uh, the fantasy and the science fiction writers that would come later. Um, but these are, the, the character, right, is not the way that people like really credit him with. The first thing we ever see Conan do in Phoenix on the Sword is lament that he has to kill a poet. Right. Because poets create, you know, art and beauty for the world and that like it sucks, but he's against him. That's yeah. not the like Schwarzenegger picture that everybody has. Sure. Right. These are these are really complicated. They're really old fashioned characters. Right. But that's refreshing, I think, at this point, considering we're like drowning in like modern characters, that to have someone isn't complicated in the way that we expect, but it's still complicated. Right. Uh, is really a credit uh, to his abilities as a writer. Right. Uh, now it's funny right because i was talking about how um you know a lot of uh a lot of fantasy like builds out of bad history right and a lot of conan's world building is obscure place names from like weird bits of history that nobody keeps up with like like the Chimerians are a uh a steppe nomad tribe that invaded like the caucuses uh, oh, no i didn't know oh, yeah it, it, like <laughs> i forget when like the fifth century bc maybe right because they're like waves of like you know proto mongols that would invade Asia and Europe all the time, right? The Chimerians are one of them, but he just like borrows the name and like makes it a bunch of prehistoric Irishmen, right? Um, but um, but like if you just like look past the fact that it's just a grab bag of random names, like, he's built a world that is um, maybe not quite as deep as Middle Earth, right? But that can at least like stand its own against it, right? Um, you know, and, and you know, and not and not be ashamed. Uh, I I saw an interview with uh, the guy who's show running. Um, uh, House of the Dragon, Ryan Condal, who was doing the aborted uh, Amazon Conan show that got canceled, right? Mm -hmm. And he overstated a little bit. He said that um, that Conan really inspired Lord of the Rings, uh, you know, and that's that that's not really the case. Um, but Tolkien liked it, right? Yeah. Which is which is cool. There's a there's a, a an old interview with Elspeth De Camp where he talks about meeting Tolkien and talking to him about Conan because De Camp took over Conan. Kind of unsuccessfully, him, Lynn Carter, Robert Jordan. I don't think they they ever did Howard's work justice. Uh, yeah. But he at least was sort of repping Conan in this conversation with Tolkien. And Tolkien was like, "Oh yeah, no, I really liked really liked the old ones, right?" Which may have been a Tolkien backhanded compliment, um, as he was he was famous for those. But um, I haven't read uh, a lot, of them, but the Howard that I've read, his prose is just beautiful. I, like shocked. Like, yeah, I the only writer that he, I can really compare him to, right, is Tolkien in terms of like how he feels to read uh, the actual yeah. prose. You know, um, uh, the uh, Shadow Kingdom, right, the first Cull story, 
right? Which is great because it's literally about the reptilian conspiracy, right? <laughs> um, which is funny. Uh, but like it starts with, you know, him riding into Atlantis, right? As the mm -hmm. sort of foreign, you know, king. And uh, the people are sort of cheering him. And it's got the like, you know, the silver trumpets and all of this. And I immediately think of Minas Tirith, right? It, it really, it takes me to that same sort of place. Uh, yeah. And he's the only other writer I know that really does that. Um, and, um, and and he's 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 really great. And for people to reduce him to just like he writes tough guys is like so so stupid. Like probably people that haven't read it. Yeah, yeah, there are people who probably saw just the Jason Momoa movie, not even right. the, not even the Arnold <laughs> one, right? Uh, although that movie that movie is not nearly as bad as people think. Uh, it's 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 watchable. It's fun. Um, but no, Conan is great. Um, so. Um, and he's another one too that kind of blurs the genre lines because Tower of the Elephant is totally a science fiction story too, right? Because yeah. there's an alien in it, uh, mm -hmm. and um, and so I'm I'm really big at hammering on that line between fantasy and science fiction because it doesn't belong there, uh, and we can just we can just throw that wall away. Uh, that would be good. Fine so, with me. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah, it's more fun. Um, but um, number uh, number four. Yeah, four. Number four. I think, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've got my I've got my sticky note here. I just get lost. Um, is one that, um, I, if Mike's still here, he's going to make fun of me. Cause I, I mentioned this man every single time and he's going to be on the list, Mike. So if you're here, I'm sorry, uh, is, is Tim Powers, uh, the okay. stress of her regard. Okay. Um, when you said that I could include things that people would sort of recognize as horror, I was like, okay, I'm going to change yeah. it. Cause I was going to say declare, um, which, uh, which is also great. But if I, like I said, I'm only picking one from each writer or yeah. all of their work in the case of Lovecraft and Howard. Um, you know, uh, then I'm going to pick The Stress of Her Regard, which is a vampire novel. Um, mm -hmm. But it's more than a vampire novel. Uh, it, you know, uh, Tim Powers, uh, like uh, like I Gabriel K, uh, is really, really interested in sort of historical period that he's going to be working with. Yeah. Unlike K, he actually sets his stories in our world, right, in our right. history. And uh, when people ask him you know they'll, they'll say in interviews like so this is set in a version of the world that like has vampires he says no it's set in our world and our world has vampires right, right? Like, that's his sort of that's his bit right um he's, he's hilarious uh in his in his interviews but um he he works really really hard to bring his stories as close to plausible as possible so that like if i read him when i was 10 i would have believed it was real right um, cause I was, you know, like all 10 year olds, very credulous, you know, I was like, Atlantis totally exists. I read a book that said it did. Um, I thought Sherlock Holmes was real until I was like 12, like, sure, you know, sure. yeah, no, it's, um, so, but, but he really like, really blurs that line between history and, and, and fantasy. And so this book is about Lord Byron. It's about, uh, the Shelley's Percy Mary, uh, <laughs> it's about John Keats, all those romantic poets yeah, and yeah. about the vampires who are also the muses. Right. And so the artists have these sort of parasitic relationships with these vampires. Um, and um, they also uh, relate to the Nephilim from like Genesis and, uh, you know, all of this stuff. So it's really, really tied in on its mythology and the like level of detail in which he's considered like how we can make, you know, this bit of mythology related to this vampire story I want to tell or to history is really awesome. It's all wrapped up in the, um, the uh, wars of liberation between Italy and the Austrian Empire, right? Yeah. So it's also really historically grounded. Um, and it um, really paints these realistic portraits of the characters too. I'm like like Powers, I'm a big fan of Lord Byron. This is the most credible Lord Byron, like I, to my mind at least, that I've ever seen on the page. It's amazing. Um, and so like the, the amount of research and like random little references in the book, it's also scary as hell. Um, and uh, and so it is, um, to my mind, uh, it's my favorite vampire novel, but it, you know, speaking, you know, academically, it's second only to Dracula in my mind, okay. right? Uh, but it's it's even more, you know, for me, right? Um, I, you can always tell, too, when a writer, like, really, like, has some personal expertise in what he's talking about. There's a sword fight in this one where I did, I did uh, Olympic fencing for about 10 years growing up, right? I read this, like... Tim Powers has, has fenced before, I can tell, right? And I emailed him because I used to work with him, right? And I was like, Tim, you need fence? And he's like, oh, yeah, totally. Uh, and it's just really fun when you can, like, see those little details kind of rise to the surface um, yeah. on the page. And uh, if there's, like, any – because I feel like 
I, I recommend Tim Powers every single time, but I'm going to do it until BookTube talks about him because he is. I really want to read him. I want to start yeah. with Anubis Gates. I think that probably is the one that would be good for me to start with. That's another one. It also features Lord Byron. Uh, okay. Yeah, he, he's such a big Byron fan. He wrote about him twice. But that one yeah. is time travel and the Egyptian gods. And it's yeah. really, uh, that book is the original the original steampunk novel, right? Okay. When it was the 80s and the cyberpunks were a thing, uh, Tim Powers and a couple of his friends were like, well, we're writing all this neo-Victorian stuff. So like we can be the steampunks. And it didn't mean, you know, goths discovering brown and putting random gears on themselves at the time. It meant like, you know, we're going to do this neo-Victorian revival fiction and include a bunch of occult stuff in it. Um, and uh, and Tim was like sort of the William Gibson of that, right? And it didn't really go anywhere, but really cyberpunk didn't either, right? As a literary movement, it kind of died and became like an anime video game thing. Um, but, um, but he was one of the OG steampunks. So. Two quick comments. Uh, Caitlin says, "Pretty sure Hadrian likes Frankenstein." Is that he uh, certainly read it, right? He quotes <laughs> Frankenstein in *Howling Dark*. Yeah, right. um, yeah, he certainly uh, certainly read it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, he probably does like it. He's uh, he's he's the right kind of melancholy and spooky. Uh, but uh, no, Hadrian, as you'll notice, is a big audiobook guy, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which like he never says outright, but he's he, you know constantly is the comms patch behind his ear, and as he's walking around the ship alone for years, he just reads everything he can. I'm sure he listens to everything on double speed at this point too. So yeah, yeah. he's a pro. And then Mad says uh, she's reading Stress of Her Regard in October. So that's pretty Excellent. cool. Yes. Yeah. All part of my plan to meme Mike into, into reading, uh, into reading Tim Powers. Cause he How will love him. Uh, Such audio a big Stephen King fan. Is um, I think, is it, is it Simon Vance? I think it's Simon oh. Vance. Uh, so like full stop, it's either him or John Lee. I can tell you real quick. I think, um, actually no, cause it doesn't list them anymore. Um, it just, no, it doesn't. Okay. But it's, uh, but it's a good yeah, audio. I think Simon Vance reads Stress of Her Regard, if I remember right. Um, Vance, so, you know, Mount Rushmore. I love Simon Vance. Yeah. He's one of the best. Um, I, I've gone out of my way to read books just cause he was on them. Um, thanks to Dune, uh, cause he was on the new recording. So he does yeah. a lot of Gabriel K as well, right? Uh, he does a lot of them. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think all of it. Um, mm -hmm. But he, uh, yeah, no, Vance is, Vance is one of my favorites. Um, yeah, I didn't uh, I didn't talk about audio with Conan and Lovecraft, but, like, there are so many recordings, like, you can find one that's good, right? Um, yeah, I was wondering if I had a specific one, but I, I found one for Howard that I like, but I couldn't tell you. Off there's a head. recording by a guy called Finn J.D. John, and he's done both yeah. of them. They oh. are really comprehensive. Uh, so he like reads all of them. A lot of the like better productions will do just like one or two Lovecraft or Howard stories, but mm -hmm. the, the, the John recordings are like solid and you can get everything for like, you know, um, like one or two downloads, which is, yep. which is a good deal. Yeah. It's huge. Um, and I think he's like, I think he's like a fan that like, like it's a fan recording basically like he, cause a lot of those are public domain now, but so he did yeah. his own, thing, but he's like a Howard Lovecraft scholar or something like that. If I remember right, I might Very be thinking cool. somebody else. Um, okay, that's awesome. Yeah. We're to the big three. We're yeah. Three. And, and, you know, as you'll notice, I've shifted into making objective quality claims uh, with, with Tim Powers here. So I'm going to just keep doing that. Um, three, I've already mentioned him. Guy Gabriel K yeah. uh, is a genius. Uh, him and Tim Powers have to like duke it out for favorite living fantasy writer for me. Um, cool. They're both just astonishingly, astonishingly good. Um, and and they do a lot of the, do a lot of the same things. Like I said, they work really closely with history. And mm -hmm. as folks know, I am a big um, I'm a big sort of Roman uh, Byzantine history guy. And yeah. so when I learned that there was an epic fantasy duology. Uh, about the Justinian, uh, the, the Constantinople of Justinian, right? Uh, sixth century Constantinople, written by the dude who worked as the like editor, you know, uh, apprentice to Christopher Tolkien on the Silmarillion. I, I already knew it was going to be perfect. I was not prepared for it to be better than perfect. Um, <laughs> sailing to Serantium and Lord of Emperors are absolutely just they're 11 out of five like they are i've, I've heard yeah incredible incredible books now they are 100 percent for me right yeah. like they're about my favorite you know period in history justinian is my favorite roman emperor bar none right such a fascinating like weird guy would not listen to his uh you know uh his sort of counsel 
ever, right? Uh, the nobles hated him. He was an unwashed, you know, Latin rube, right? All these like Greek eggheads just couldn't handle him. Um, made it worse by marrying a prostitute, right? Um, who then they had to take orders from, and boy, they did not like it. Um, you know, brought the city through riots, revolts, plagues, uh, recaptured Rome from the Germans, right? They didn't get to keep it, but they managed it. <laughs> Uh, you know, with the help of, of course, uh, Belisarius, right, the greatest general, uh, you know, one of the greatest generals in Roman history, right? Um, and, you know, uh, managed, uh, re re completely reconstituted Roman law, right? Uh, built the Hagia Sophia, uh, and then, uh, you know, so left Constantinople, uh, you know, uh, better than they found it, and then managed to both, at least to the Greek Orthodox guys, become saints, right? Him and his mm -hmm. wife, both saints. Uh, huge, you know, awesome, right? Fascinating, fascinating period. Uh, this is, of course, set on a fantasy version of that. All the characters have different names. It's not Byzantium. It's Serantium, right? Sure. It's not Christ and, you know, it's not Christianity. It's, you know, the, the, it's Jadism, uh, mm -hmm. you know, everything's different, but sure. it's about that period. And he, he makes it, you know, his own world so he can do different things with it mm -hmm. and change the outcome a little bit. The story is about, uh, Caius Crispius, uh, called Crispin by his friends, not where I got the name from. Okay. Uh, and uh, he was a mosaicist who is sent to Serantium to work on the dome of their version of the Hagia Sophia, right? And along the mm -hmm. way, he fights, uh, you know, pagan murder cults and, you know, has to, uh, you know, help a crazy alchemist and, like, do all these weird stuff. The magic is so bizarre and, like, strange, but also, like, beautiful and wonderful and understated enough that it still feels special. It's not like we're using water nymphs to like water the grass, right? It's, you know, it's, it's, it's got that same kind of restraint that George Martin has with his magic. Mm -hmm. So if you yeah. like that aspect of, of mm -hmm. Home and Ice and Fire, you'd be right at home with this. Mm -hmm. um, the character work is just amazing, right? It's, it's beautifully sad, right? Cause there's a sort of, you know, and this is true of like a lot of Kay's work. He like knows that history is a tragedy right certainly for the people in it and maybe in the sure. long term generally and so there's always this sense that you get from tolkien too that like there are no elves in the book but you get the sense that like the elves are leaving middle earth right like everything's mm -hmm. getting a little bit less glorious in a way mm -hmm. uh, and it's because of the sort of grubby venial nature of mankind but at the same time like humanity is still good and worth celebrating and he's got all of that in this really nice balance and where i'm critical of martin right is that he doesn't have that balance right k i think nails it um okay. You know, there's still a lot of the same sort of like creeping ugliness under the surface. Like, you know, like one of the courtiers is like clearly a monster in yeah. like classic George Martin kind of waves. But like, you know, the emperor might not be that bad a guy, right? And like they're trying to make the world better despite all of this. And so it's it's really got this great tone, this great feeling to it. Um, and um, and and great world too. Like there, I wish. Uh, I wish there were more, I wish the series were like eight books long because there's stuff with like, you see the like, um, the fantasy version of the Persian court, the Sasanians in this mm -hmm. a little bit and like, holy cow, like, you know, a couple books of this would be cool, man. Like, can you do that? And he has written more books in this universe, but right. rather than do, you know, um, you know, one big, you know, period of time and do this, you know, complicated, you know, 40 point of view character kind of deal, he instead will skip, you know, forward a thousand years and tell another story. So like the Lions of Alversan is set in the same universe, uh, but it's set during like the Reconquista in Spain. So like 900 years later, right? And it's about getting that world's versions. It's about the conflict between that versions, uh, version of the world's Christians and their Muslims, right? They're Jadites and Asherites, right? But they're trying to, you know, um, the Jadites are trying to kick the Asherites back across the sea into, you know, North Africa and retake what is Spain, right? So they've done that. There's a version that's about Alfred the Great. So if you like your last kingdoms and you want to see the guy K take on that, you can read that book. And he's done a bunch of other stuff too in the same timeline uh same universe with like uh, uh renaissance italy and even revisits uh serantium in his, one of his more recent books but after it's become uh you know um asherite right because constantly okay. gets taken by the muslims right so that yeah. happens to in this timeline and so he revisits a lot of the same stuff so all the books have this sort of extended historical connection and even some of the characters will be related you know distant mm -hmm. and things like that so but those first two uh chronologically the first two books um sailing to serantium and lord of emperors are absolute top tier top quality reads for me um uh, just brilliant brilliant works of fantasy between you hyping it and Jake Bishop, I uh, 
I, I really want to get to him, but I'm also a crazy completionist. So I, I want to get to him when I can dedicate a lot of time to K's works, like one a month till. Yeah, reading all the others. Yeah, I think you will love them. Because uh, I, I know as much as you love Martin, he feels Martin-esque in a lot of ways, but he feels closer to Tolkien at the same time. Um, and, uh, and, you know, obviously was, right, in a sense, right? Because he, right. You know, the man, I've been told he, like, never talks about it, but he worked on the Silmarillion, right? Yeah. Like when he was a grad student, which is amazing, right? Yes, um, yeah. yeah, I, um, but yeah, apparently it's not something he talks much about, which, like, you know, you probably shouldn't, right? So, like, you know, I totally get it, but it's amazing, amazing, right? Jake so. also says he's the only one that is a little bit better than Hobb when it comes to prose writing. And, uh. As we know, Hobb is my favorite author of all time. So. Yeah, he's he, a beautiful writer. So if he can at least get to her level, let alone exceed it, I'll be very happy. So yeah, beautiful writer and a really nice guy too. Uh, yep. You know, you've read his stuff. Like he responds to tweets and has always mm -hmm. always been gracious to me. He remembered yep. me actually from a Twitter exchange when I met him. He was like, like "I like just like talked to you a couple weeks ago." And I was like, "Yeah, that's weird that you would remember that." But <laughs> uh, very, very, very nice guy. Um, and I've never read anything from him that wasn't brilliant. Um, so, uh, number number two, I decided to put on this list uh, to make a point about the fence uh, because it was on the other list, and it's the only one that could go on both. Uh, and that's the Book of the New Sun by Gene Wolfe, uh, which I don't I don't need to talk about again because I did that already. Uh, but it's it's my favorite science fiction series, uh, and it's also totally a fantasy series. So I'm pulling it out. Uh, just to make the point, because yeah. like, what what's the difference, right? Um, you know, when people talk about like, oh, is this fantasy or science fiction? They mean like, are there wizards in this or robots? But this is both. It has, uh, both. It has <laughs> both plausibly and credibly, uh, and you know, it's written like an epic fantasy, right? If if you're comfortable with like the first person, you know, sort of character driven stuff, like like Hobbes, like that, right? I haven't mm -hmm. I, I thought I remembered that, or my own work, or uh, you like, you know. Um, name the wind or like any of those other like first person confessional books yeah. it's, it feels like that you'll feel right at home and you won't notice for a while that like the towers of this castle are actually rockets and this castle is actually an abandoned spaceport right that like people don't know how to use anymore right and you it takes you a really long time to realize if you don't know going in that this is really a science fiction novel right uh it's dying earth in the tradition of like jack vance right which is you know, a science fiction series, but that's the science fiction series that D&D &D gets its magic system from, right? Uh, you know, which is one of the great ironies of D&D &D, is that its magic system is actually uh, a science system from a science fiction series. Uh, but that's because the wall doesn't exist, right? Uh, you know, Pern is a science fiction series, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it's got dragons and dragon riders and, you know, knights and stuff, like it's fantasy. And so I cheekily will put this here uh, because it's excellent and everybody should read it, but because it's both, right? And it really, like, we need to, like, get out of the, like, dumb taxonomic thinking that we have as science fiction and fantasy readers and, like, want to know, like, it's, it's like talking to metal fans, right? And they're like, oh, I won't listen to black metal. I'll, only, you know, I'm, or, you know, I'll only listen to, you know, death metal. And, right. like, that's the same thing to, like, people who don't know any better, right? And what that, and what all these walls do is confuse new people to the point where they're like, I don't know that I'd like this book, right? Because it's got a category label attached to it that I don't like, right? Like, you know, I don't like uh, urban fantasy very much. I read the first three Dresden Files books. I thought they were fun, uh, you know? And, you didn't you know, get the good stuff, but that's all right. I've heard I haven't gotten to the good stuff, but that's another yeah. one. There are many, like, I just like, it's like, these are like good. And I'm like, I was wrong. Like, these are fun books, but uh, you know, do I want to read 15 more right now? Uh, if they're going to be like this, no. And everyone's like, no, like two more books, dude. It gets like eight times. <laughs> they're great. Uh, yeah, Death Max is great. But, but that's okay. Off topic. But yeah, one of these days. It's been like 10, it's been like 10 years too. So yeah. Um, I, uh, years, right? like so these I read the motions. first chapter of Shadow of the Torture and was completely intimidated and completely lost and felt completely over my head. So I will get to it at some point, but uh, no chapter in anything I've ever read has made me feel dumber than that first chapter of Shadow of the Torture. I'm yeah, like, really, well, I, this is English, but I don't think we're speaking the same language right now. I don't know what was going on. So did you listen to it or did you read it? I was reading it, yeah. Okay. I can't recommend the audio enough. 
Uh, it's Jonathan Davis, right? Jonathan Davis, who is one of my favorites, because yeah. I'm a big Star Wars guy. I used yeah. to read a lot of the Star Wars audiobooks. So yeah. I hear Anakin Skywalker when in Severian, which is a very, very uh, strange experience for me. Yeah. But he's he's tremendous, right? And and I've always found, right, um, because I I became an audiobook reader like really early, right? Because I read mm -hmm. I read The Hobbit around the same time I read uh, Harry Potter. I was four or five, right? Mm -hmm. I got the Hobbit okay because I you know I was the right age to get the Hobbit. Sure. I went right into Lord of the Rings and bounced off really hard. Um, but the, this is right around the time the movie trailers were starting to come out. And I was like, this looks so cool. Like, I want to know about it, right? And my parents didn't want me to go because it was PG-13 and I wasn't 13. So I was like, well, you let me read the book, right? And, and they would, and I couldn't do it. And they eventually got me the CDs. So I had the CDs for Lord of the Rings. Um, uh, and I guess I can just segue and say Lord of the Rings. Obviously <laughs> I think we all know what number one. My number one, and it will never move because it is the best <laughs> fantasy novel of all time, and it will never be equaled. And everyone who says differently is wrong. Um, I, I I love it, but I'm wrong. So sorry, yeah. but please, uh, I, I want to hear your yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, but so I had the CDs right, and they were like I think like 30 CDs a book, yeah. and I would literally fall asleep for years listening to them. So I have literally been through the Lord of the Rings like 150 times. Uh, and every time I listen to it, one, I'm still not bored, which shouldn't be possible. Right. Uh, and two, uh, I find something new, right? And the only other books that I feel are that inexhaustible uh, are our new son, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to talk about these books in, in relation to each other because sure. of, of that attitude. And now with Wolf, right, I totally understand bouncing off of it because I think I probably must have when I was a kid because I was like told to read it. And like, I have like vague memories, uh, had vague memories of like, this was about a guy who was a torturer or something. Um, and then when I reread it in college, I was like, this book is amazing, right? Um, and even so, the first time I was like, I don't understand, like, why are they they're eating people? I don't, mm. um, but uh, but I went back to it. And there's this great Gene Wolfe essay I've talked about a billion times about mm -hmm. Tolkien. It's yeah. called uh, The Best Introduction to the Mountains. And if you just search that, you can find it. And it's about Gene Wolfe reading Tolkien for the first time. Mm -hmm. And it, like, absolutely felt like my experience, right? Wolfe um, instantly, when he starts really, like, getting into Lord of the Rings, he's older than me when he started reading it, obviously. He realizes how special it was and, like, budgets reading Lord of the Rings. Uh, he'll only read one new chapter a night, but he'll let himself reread as much as he wants. So it took him ages to get through it, but he was mm -hmm. reading constantly. And so he kind of like arrived at the same place, you know, I did by different means, right? Because I was just listening to it. It was the only audiobooks I owned because this was like the early aughts CDs. And, and the CDs like, were like $70 set or something. It was not that cheap. I remember. It was not cheap. That was my only Christmas present one year. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And they are, um, they are long since busted. Uh, you know, but uh, those are the old Rob English recordings. Mm -hmm. And like, it got to the point like where I knew where you could like kind of hear a door close in the background. Cause like, you know, they were, uh, they were not the best audio recordings. Right. Although still as great as the Andy circus ones are, I found myself being like, Andy, you did not enunciate that line of dialogue correctly. Rob Inglis did it differently. Uh, I adore, I adore those recordings, um, you know, for all of their like early sort of jankiness. Um, yeah. they're great. But Lord of the Rings, right, um, they're just, like, I, I, this is all, like, a, it's hard to confess to this, but I, like, like weep openly rereading, like, the whole back half of Return of the King, like, reliably, every single time from, like, uh, leaving Kirith Ungol to, like, Sam coming home, like, I just, like, am constantly, like, oh, geez, Tolkien, stop. No other book does this to me, uh, yep. not even remotely, right? Um, and... You know, I don't know if that's because, like, the more I read it, the more cognizant of the fact you, uh, I am of the fact that so much of this is is World War One, right? And yeah. it is Tolkien watching not just his, his friends and losing his friends, right, in the fighting, but is watching the England that he knew kind of get destroyed, right? Um, you know, in Saruman, you see, like, the industrialization of, like, Northern England and and you know um the coal industry and you know the miserable conditions that people lived in under you know dealing with all of that and like the social changes that come along you know with the modernizing of stuff and tolkien just watching his whole world like disappear right um and um and, and that's all really really painful right and it's something that he's still like he's still able to see 
you know, the, the, the bright spots, right? And he, he also does this thing that so much fantasy, like, doesn't do, right? So much fantasy is interested in kings and emperors, or it's interested in, like, peasant stereotypes. Like, they'll have, like, the tavern worker and, you know, the prostitute and the thief. But, like, yeah, yeah there aren't a lot of fantasy books that are actually about normal peasants, right? Mm-hmm. Now, Frodo's, like, a, a wealthy normal peasant, right? He's, like, a country squire. But, like, Sam, Mary, Pitt, those are, like, normal dudes right and they are normal dudes you know uh, who are are called upon right to you know save the world right through small actions and they don't even succeed right they fail right and and that's true like you try to fix the world you will fail right um the world only gets better by like you know um like really providence right Mm -hmm. and it is it is providence and it is it is that essentially like christian virtue of mercy on the part of bilbo and frodo and sam too right in not the top five character in all of literature for me i absolutely for sam he's so great right but at the same time i feel like so much of the affection for sam comes at the expense of frodo and part of that i think is probably jackson's fault yeah i think the books is a lot stronger uh, and a lot more admirable than um, the Elijah Wood performances. And that's not Elijah Wood's fault, but like, sure. you know, um, there isn't a bad character in the bunch. Even the ones that like really don't have a lot of time, like Legolas like, and Gimli, like really don't have that much to do. Their right? friendship was so deeply meaningful to me as a teenager. Like the way that they came together, despite the hate, the bitter hatred between dwarves and elves. It just that that meant a lot to me and still does whenever it's- I read. It's great, right? Like even even Pippin, who's kind of like the butt of like most Lord of the Rings jokes, like yeah. has a lot to do. It's meaningful, sure. right? And and two, when they get home and the Shire like needs to be saved and 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 Frodo's not really in a state to do it, right? Like literally he gets home, finds his house has been taken over by Saruman, and he's still like, it's like just go. Like I can't, like I can't do it, right? Like Mary and Pippin are the ones who like get the hobbits together and like drive, you know, Saruman and his communists out, right? Um and um and it's you know all those characters have something to do they're all deeply meaningful and you know people will get on tolkien for you know not having enough uh you know uh female characters right all of them are great right mm-hmm. and, and it's like not even true if you read like the extended tolkien stuff he's got he's got luthien he's got idril right all these tremendous characters you guys just didn't read lord you read only lord of the rings right uh and even then right like a one's amazing um yep. you know and Arwen really exists only as an idea in the books, right? But that idea is, like, so important to who Aragorn is, right? Like, the Aragorn of the books, right, is, like, again, I love the Peter Jackson films, but people get on him for, for butchering Faramir. He really butchers Aragorn, right? Wow, Aragorn yeah. never questions his destiny or his purpose in the books. He knows, right, that he has to become High King of Gondor and Arnor because it's the only condition under which he can marry the woman of his of his dreams, Right. Uh, who wants him to marry him, right? So it's not like he's trying to, like, win some prize that, like, no, this is, like, a a mutual thing. But, like, that marriage is only going to happen if the world is saved, right? And it's that that love, right, that animates Aragorn. Like, all these characters are infinitely deep and meaningful. And the fact that he can do that with very minimal explanation, and it's all there, and everybody understands it, Mm -hmm. is one of the reasons why he's still the very best fantasy writer, because... Um, like by comparison, right? Um, and this is not to, to denigrate Martin, right? Martin oh, has sure. to take a lot more time to explain why his characters are the way they are and to get you to root for them. And now, in part, it's because there are so many, so many, so many more of them, right? Sure. But it takes a lot more to get that done. Tolkien is a much lighter hand, mm-hmm. um, and people still like there's there's some readers who don't get it, right? They just like like I don't know like, these kid these these hobbits have weird names. Why do I care about them? Like you have a weird name, right? Like. <laughs> stop right like you know they're normal people his name is sam it's not that weird right uh you know mary adoc maybe a little bit but uh you know um like no all of these characters are great and it doesn't take a lot to get uh doesn't take a lot to get them there right and that's part of part of his skill as a writer and, and and it comes from the fact that and and i haven't mentioned this yet he is the greatest world builder of all time right um and anyone who just spent a fair amount of time at it yeah like I, <laughs> granted granted this is why he's not a more prolific writer right yeah. but he wasn't trying to be a prolific writer he sure. was trying to do this other thing and the right. writing happened incidentally right 
And and this is, of course, like this is why I think a lot of fantasy writers and people who want to be fantasy writers, especially, have failed, is because they yep. think they have to do that. Like you do not need 30 languages to like make sense and have grammars before you start writing. Like I don't recommend it, right? <laughs> um, you know, and so he's he's created this image of what the writer should be that I think is wrong because no one's gonna no one's gonna duplicate Lord of the Rings. I've said before, I think Lord of the Rings is the only one of these novels that people are gonna read in a thousand years. Um yep. I think you know, I I am sure very, very little, right? You never know who like really is gonna be Shakespeare, right? Um, but I think that if you know any you know English language literature makes it you know three thousand years out and is sort of like the Gilgamesh of you know five thousand A.D., it's going to be this, right? Um, and and you could see this too in the reaction to it in the twentieth century, right? Um, this was coming out when like modernist literature was like a big thing and everything was sort of drab and cynical. It was post both of the world wars, right? And so there was reason to be. You know, everyone was worried about communism. This is when uh you know and, and not unjustly i mean they were killing millions of people at the time but um you know um this was not that right this was romantic it was hopeful it was very old-fashioned right when it came out people like literary critics were like this is a really atavistic throwback to like 19th century literature and nobody will like it well jokes on you it turns out like everybody did <laughs> right and and it was so countercultural, right uh because it was so old-fashioned Right. So it was it was this weird sort of it was in this weird space. Right. Because he's this like really stuffy, stodgy, you know, conservative, devoutly religious Oxford professor and like Led Zeppelin and the hippies like pick up on it. Right. Like so it, it, it reaches everybody in this crazy way. And they're really there hasn't like Harry Potter is a big deal and probably sold more copies, but its impact was a lot shallower, I think. Because I find that a lot of people, especially, you know, in, in like, you know, hardcore reading circles are kind of like done with it, right, for one reason or another. You know, either they've grown up or they found stuff that's way better or, you know, whatever, right? Um, Lord of the Rings, I don't think is going anywhere. Um, and so while I'm making my objective arguments for it, I just like... It, you don't have to talk about it. I love it, obviously. I, so my parents who don't read, like, not... For any other reason than it's just not a hobby of theirs. Yeah, they're, they read Lord of the Rings growing up, and they're the reason I love fantasy. Basically, they gave me a battered copy of The Hobbit. They gave me their battered copies of Lord of the Rings, and I was reading that stuff before I was reading anything else. So, yeah, basically, I had Narnia first, and then The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, and like off to the races. So, yeah, I mean, there's that. That's still how it's done, right? You know, for people my age, it was Harry Potter, where my parents read Harry Potter to me. Uh, but then I went and found it because that seemed like the next logical place to go. And then, of course, the movie has hit at exactly the right time for me to notice that they existed. Sure. Because uh, my parents aren't big readers either, right? My dad, I don't think, had read a fiction uh, novel uh, since he read Harry Potter to us until mine came out. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. You know, like, he that's just not what he does, right? Sure. Yeah. He doesn't think it's – it's not that he thinks, like, reading is bad. He's not one of those right. parents, right? It's just, right. like, I have other things to do. Yeah. Uh, you know, very like practical hobbies kind of guy. Um, Same with my folks, yeah. Yeah, my mother was sort of a big influence in terms of like fantasy and stuff, but it was mostly movies, right? So I like watched a lot of '80s like schlock sword and sorcery movies because that's what she likes. So I like I grew up on like Highlander and Beastmaster uh -huh. and and stuff like that. Um, and that's where like the Arthur stuff came in, Excalibur yeah. and, and all, not, not that Excalibur is schlock; it's a good film. Um, but um, you know, but but again, the the reading was never like a was was really a thing they emphasized they always encouraged me to do it yeah. but it was it was not because they were big readers it was because mm -hmm. they knew that i was becoming one mm -hmm. um so it was a little bit of a different thing but but that's how it is right like there is there's really there's that one book that finds us at you know at the right time right and that usually is early but it can be later um mm -hmm. and because like i found new sun much later right sure um but it it sort of changes you right kind of permanently either by making you a reader or you know in some subtler way right um and lord of the rings really you know i cemented that this is what i wanted to do uh i wanted to be like tolkien like so many of us right I, you know i do have at least one actual language that i made up and have grammar for right i'm not doing that for a while like that was <laughs> that's not my skill set but 
I, um, you know, I knew I, uh, I knew I needed to do it. Um, and in part that's because of that DNA. When I started writing, um, the sun eater was, uh, was going to be a fantasy series mm -hmm. and it transformed because I didn't know there was a fence, uh, you know, and that was, that was largely because, um, I grew up playing a lot of video games and video games, especially Japanese video games are not cognizant of that fence. Sure. Uh, going back to berserk, right. The, the demons in Berserk feel like H.R. Geiger monsters, right? Or, or like Lovecraft stuff. They don't feel like, you know, your typical, like, um, like, uh, uh, like demons, right? They don't <laughs> feel like fantasy creatures, really. They have this weird science fictional element to them. They're named after science fiction novels from the 60s, right? Uh, you know, they're named after, like, Frank Herbert and Zelazny novels, mm -hmm. uh, which is a nice little reference in Berserk, right? Uh, you know, it's kind of, kind of cool to see the influence go, you know, in the other direction. Um, but, um, but I was never cognizant of that fence because I grew up playing a lot of these, uh, these games where you'd have, you know, robots and witches and all of this stuff together. And sure. so the series slowly turned from something a lot more, um, aesthetically Tolkien into something else, right? It looks more, it looks more Herbert. It looks more Wolf, but like, yeah. I hope that my, so I, I, I hope that if I were El Sprague de Camp and I sat down with Tolkien, right, that he would say I did okay. Um, you know, I'll I've always not... consider it fantasy, which I'm sure is wrong, but I just have a bias and fantasy is my genre. So I will yeah. always call it a fantasy series, even though, you know, it could be something else. But yeah. that's how I feel. I say science fiction to not confuse buyers. Yeah. You know? But it's it's spiritually fantasy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, no, that's how I feel. I, uh, I, I know I kind of like just ranted at you for an hour. And no. There. <laughs> no, this has been wonderful. It's been great. But uh, yeah. So no, uh, were there any other questions in the chat that we needed to get to? Or it looks like people have been quiet there. Yeah, uh, I think, I think uh, just some people chiming in here and there, but I appreciate everybody coming. Um, I think I did. did yeah, no, please. I don't, I don't remember what it was, so that's all right. Um, <laughs> Would you like to tell everybody where they can find you? And, and yeah, all the social yeah, sites? sure. Uh, so uh, obviously, I'm Christopher Rocchio. You can find my books basically uh, anywhere uh, the books are sold. You can see them uh, displayed there over uh, over Scout's shoulder. Empire yeah. Silence is the first one. Um, but if you want to find me, uh, my website is solanempire.com. S O L L A N Empire.com. You can also find me right here on uh, YouTube at sun eater books uh i do uh live streams at least once a month i'm really trying to trying to do more uh with the channel but it's hard because i also am writing so uh but you can find me there and uh i would uh, love to see you all there too so thanks uh thanks for listening to my uh impassioned rant about fantasy uh, i hope i didn't scare anybody uh away with my uh unorthodox opinions or by the fact that i haven't read your favorite series because i'm sure that i haven't read your favorite series dear reader whoever you are <laughs> um, but, um, but thank yeah, you. Caitlin just finished Howling Dark, which I am about 66% into my reread. And Caitlin, uh, <laughs> was asking what happened after a couple of very interesting scenes that we all know and, and love. Yeah. Howling Dark is still my favorite, uh, of the bunch. Uh, it was, it was the smoothest writing experience. I had just learned how to outline because, uh, the first book I had no due date. So I like noodled at it for years. And then they were like, you know, we, you know, expect the next one in a year. And I was like, oh, shit. Uh, and so I had to completely, you know, learn. I had to learn how to be professional, basically. And it went so well, uh, you know, which uh, cannot be said of subsequent novels for various reasons. Uh, they might have been split in half, for example, uh, or, or something. So uh, it was it was the book that I had the, the sort of most like simple, the most simple emotional experience working on. And for that, I think it's still my favorite. Uh, that being said, book six is going really well. So yeah, um, so your update today on the Patreon, which people should also check out for you. And looks like you're about 35% of the writing. So that's yes, yeah. So there is a chance though that uh, I was thinking there were going to be two more books. Mm -hmm. uh, my publisher is leaning towards one more book uh, yeah. for various reasons. So the Patreon estimates where it says 56 chapters might be wrong. It might be more like 90 chapters because I'm going to have to. It's going to be one big book. There's no one short book. So it's going to be either one giant novel or two reasonably sized ones. Uh, but so if you are on the Patreon, you may see that the um, that number jumps dramatically in the next couple weeks as I outline sure. the rest of it. Uh, so uh, keep an eye out for that. Don't be alarmed. 
Uh, but it's looking like six may be the last novel in the series, which, uh, you know, symbolically is interesting given Hadrian's uh, darker associations. Uh, so I'll take it, you know. Uh, but uh, it's going very well. Uh, I am working on chapter 21 at the moment. Uh, and things are, would you believe it, getting really weird. So, um, you know. That is hard to believe. I uh, cannot wait till I can get through my rereads so I can get my Ashes of Man arc going because. Uh, Brent has read it and loved it, obviously. So I am super, super excited to get to it. So yeah, I've been psyched to see the early responses to it. I was really scared with the novels being split that mm -hmm. it was going to be my feast for crows, and uh, you know uh, that did not happen because it's weird, right? I got the books split in the same place. Uh, it's kind of interesting because um, you know those were originally one book too. So um, fortunately, only one POV, so I don't have to shovel the Cersei chapters in one book. Sure. Um, Got him. Like the uh, but I, I get why somebody wouldn't. Like <laughs> it's she's it's tough to be inside her head, uh, which I yeah um, yeah no it's it's not a pleasant experience. <laughs> I uh, no I, I I'm just making fun of her because she's my least favorite character. But yeah. um, you know we all have to have one right. So um, but yeah no so it's uh, it, I I've been happy that everybody seems to be uh, be enjoying book five so far. That's very exciting. It won't be out until December, of course, but they've been very liberal with the review copies, which was I was a pleasant shocked. surprise. So, Jay Mashuzu is uh, fifty percent into Ashes of Man and has an interesting emoji there too. It looks concerned <laughs> there, John. So, um, yeah, I, I would be concerned too at about the halfway point in that one, but. You know, I've been concerned for most of it. Uh, Kingdoms of Death has been my favorite so far, but every one I've read has been my favorite so far. So I don't know if recency bias tends to creep in or not, but man, that was a wild ride. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take it. You know, I uh, I really I want people to fight over which one's the best one, yeah. Star Wars style, because yeah. as long as you have something to argue about, that's why I like don't like answering like serious questions. Like I'll explain like how shields work. But I'm not going to tell you what X was because if I just tell folks, then no one's going to fight about it and they'll stop talking about my book sooner, uh, which is not in my best interest. So, no. uh, you know, as long as I really hope that when the last one is done, I hope the last one is everyone's favorite. Uh, you know, and I, I it stands a fair chance. So, uh, you know, uh, but besides that, you know, I want people to really I want I want the last book to be my Empire Strikes Back. But if, you know, there are still people who like Phantom Menace better, God bless you, you know. Uh, I should have said Attack of the Clones. Attack of the Clones is worse than Phantom Menace. But, um, you know, I want people to, uh, you know, duke it out. You know, have Yeah, it's never a bad thing if people have different favorites. It means that all of them are great, so. Yeah, that, uh, that is, that's the hope there. So, no, it's been, it's been really, you know, sort of humbling. The reaction is always really cool, really cool to see. No. All right. Well, I know you need to get back to writing and uh, I can't thank you enough for your time. This has been wonderful. Yeah, no, thanks, man. This was fun. Thanks for thanks for having me on. And thank you, chat, for being here. Yeah, uh, I didn't know anyone was going to come. So I'm I'm super stoked to have people dropping by. That's good. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Well, we'll see. Uh, see you later then. Bye, everybody. Scott, thanks for having me. Bye, all. Publication order always.